Good morning to you all. <clears throat> Before I go into the scripture, I have a small question to ask. Uh, who here knows Sigmund Freud? Only one, two, three, four, okay. Few of them know. Who is Sigmund Freud? A very famous psychologist. Uh, <clears throat> not many know him because like not everyone follows or studies psychology, but if you have studied psycho psychology, you definitely know him. The reason I know him is because uh, my mom used to read a lot of psychological books before she found Jesus. Uh, she wanted to find the answers, so she used to order uh, from abroad and buy these psychological books. She went, uh, like, early mid 90s she was looking for answers but the answers were not there she found the answers in the bible the psychology helps you to understand the bible can heal you that's the difference between psychology and the bible so it's not bad but <clears throat> psychology can explain and help you to an extent not the whole way. So the reason I ask about Sigmund Freud is <clears throat> uh, there's a theory of him, which is very famous, called the uh, theory of personality, uh, which he explains how our personalities are, what comes out of us is a part of our personality, how it is, how it is created. So uh, he has three parts to it, called uh, id, ego, and superego. This word ego, it doesn't, uh, it's not the word we know as ego, as the, you know, the self-importance ego. Th this is not that. <clears throat> so this, uh, there are three parts to it. Uh, the first one I'll explain, id, it means, uh, it means the instincts we have inside us, the desires, the urges, like uh, when we see something, uh, if we feel like we want it, that is the it part of our personality. Then there is the thing called superego. Uh, superego means <coughs> morals, uh, social values, always wanting to do the right thing, as you can see there. Uh, so the superego part wants us to do the right thing no matter what. It doesn't matter how it affects us. It wants to do the right thing. Uh, that id part of us doesn't care, about the, doesn't care about what happens next. It just wants what it wants. That's it. Then the part called ego is the human part where we make the decision uh, between are we going to go with the superego or, or are we going to go with the id? It's the rational part. It's the reasoning part. Uh, it is the end result, the uh, decide of the end result. So the easiest way to explain this is uh, in cartoons, you must have seen, uh, can I have that image? Yeah. Have you seen car in cartoons, these kind of images, where uh, in the both so shoulders, uh, angel of the person appears and an evil person on the other side. And both of them are telling him what to do. <clears throat> this is the easiest way to explain this. So uh, it, uh, if the angelic person is, that is similar to superego, telling them to do the morally correct thing, and uh, the evil side of it tells him to do whatever he wants, whatever the desires he have, the evil side is asking him to do that. So uh, the theory of, uh, uh, theory of personality, uh, Sigmund Freud says uh, this is like an iceberg floating in, in, in water, as you saw in the earlier picture. So whatever is above the water, is what comes out of us. So if it is like this, uh, as you can see, the superego part is, to make it easier for you, I created a small, this thing since I can't turn the image there. 
when it's above water, uh, the super ego parts comes out, then we do the right things in our lives. But uh, if this turns, if this turns, since it's floating on the water, this part of us comes out. So this, I studied for psychology. If there are someone who have studied psychology, I'm sure you have studied this. This is one of the main parts of psychology. <clears throat> so when I studied this, I studied this many, many years ago. The revelation I, that came to me was, this is quite similar to what we try to do here, isn't it? This is what God is telling us to do. So we'll go to the first Bible verse. Uh, if we turn to Romans chapter 13, verse 14. Romans chapter 13, verse 14. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ, and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. So, there are, uh, in the Romans, it says, asked us to clothe ourselves with this part, and uh, not to gratify this part. So, this is what God is telling us to do. Who created this part? Uh, if we turn into Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, what does it say? So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. So God created this part because he wanted us to be like him. But uh, where did this part come from? If we turn into Romans chapter 5, verse 12, Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, who's the man? Adam. This part entered when man sinned, because God didn't want man to be a sinful person. God wanted us to be like this. But when Adam sinned, this this it part also came into our life. That's why we say we are born with sin. So uh, now the struggle, now the challenge we have as Christians, not just Christians, everyone, the challenge we have is how to balance this, how to not let this uh, it part of us, that dark side of us, how to control not letting it get above the water level. So I, I believe it's not just for Christians, even for anyone in the world. If you ask a small child, I'm sure they'd want to be good people. No one wants to be a bad person when they are small. But with time, with what happens around him or her, uh, because of the society, this bad part comes out. But uh, what is this main thing that feeds this it part of us. What is that main sin, I'd say, that pushes us to do the things that the it part wants us to do? Uh, if you turn into James chapter, th chapter 3, verse 13. James chapter 3, verse 16. Sorry, verse 16. For where you have envy, and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. So there it says, every evil practice comes from envy and selfishness. So if you think about it, even envy comes from selfishness. Envy is like, uh, if someone else has something you don't have, you don't like it, it's something like jealousy. So even that, the root cause of that is, selfishness. If you think about other sins, it's uh, almost all the sins, the root cause of it is selfishness. If you think about lying, why do we lie? We lie to defend ourselves, protect ourselves. I'll say me. Uh, why do I lie? To defend myself. To protect myself, to prove I am wrong, I lie. Uh, then pride. Pride is what? thinking highly of myself, thinking I'm the man. And uh, stealing, why do I steal? To have something I don't have. 
uh, what is adultery? Satisfying my needs, giving myself pleasure, not caring about someone else, it's all about me. And uh, what is greed? To have power, to have money. You can see how everything involves me, I, myself. It's all surrounded with what? Selfishness. It's all self-centered. When uh, we are self-centered and we are so focused on getting things for ourselves, we feed this it part of us, that dark side. It gets stronger and stronger as we do selfish acts. When this it part becomes stronger, what happens is, as I told you, this is the part where it makes the decisions. When this part becomes stronger, this part listens to this part, not to this part. So uh, let's say, I mean, it's pr pretty similar to Holy Spirit and the enemy, right? Holy Spirit tells us to do one thing. Enemy tells us to do the opposite thing. But if we selfishly do things to ourselves, we keep on feeding this part of us, which leads us to listen to this part rather than this part. The voice we hear from Holy, Holy Spirit, uh, it decreases, and the enemy's voice increases when we feed this part. So what happens when we feed that part? Uh, as I told you, this human part of us, that is where we make the decisions, reasoning, the rational part. It starts, it starts to reason out what this it is saying. That is when? We justify our sins. That's when we defend our sins. We tr use different ways to defend the way we sin. If Holy Spirit is in control, if this part is in control, when we make a mistake, we don't defend ourselves. We don't justify ourselves. We repent. That is what God wants us to do. But if this part is in control, we don't repent. We give reasons why we did that. For an example, if someone is stealing to feed their child, stealing is bad, but uh, this it part tells the human part of us that you have to do this. If not, your child will be hungry. But uh, if this was in control, it would say not to do that. Work hard and feed your child. Don't steal and do that. So. This all happens with our selfishness. If we keep on doing selfish acts, we, we are going to keep on feeding this it, which will lead us to sin comfortably, which is a very dangerous zone, I'd say, for us to be in. If, if, if we make a mistake, and as I said, if we feel guilty, that is how it should be. When we feel guilty, we will repent and ask for forgiveness. But when we sin and we are comfortable with it, now in the, today's world, people are proud of it. That's, that's why there's a whole month for pride. Being proud about sin, is a, it's very sad, to be honest. Uh, even... It has come to the church even that accepting sin, being comfortable in sin, this is not what God wants us to do. We, God wants us to repent and come back to him when we make a mistake, not feel comfortable when we are doing a mistake. If you look at a story from the Bible, uh, if you turn into Acts chapter 5, verse 1 to 5, there's a story about a couple who made a very selfish decision, and it turned bad for them. Acts chapter 5, verse 1 to 5. <clears throat> now a man named Ananias, together with his wife, Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, 
Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received, from the, received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied to men, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died, and great fear seized all who heard what had happened. So this, uh, at this time, uh, after Jesus passed away, the disciples, they were trying to build the church, and the, the disciples, as you know, they were not rich. So uh, the rich people from the society came and helped the church. So Ananias and Sapphira was a rich couple. They, they were in the church. They accepted Jesus. But what happened? Enemy entered and told him to be selfish, be greedy. When enemy told this, uh, Ananias was his, it must have been strong. That's why he listened to the enemy. If not, he wouldn't have done what he did. So when enemy told him, he thought, why, why do I have to give everything? No one will know. I will just keep something for myself. No one will know. But is that what happened? No. So I want to speak to you about three sins uh, Ananias committed there. Uh, one, number one, is greed. God wants us to give everything we have to him. It doesn't mean money. God expects us to give all our heart, all our time, all our energy to God. It, uh, it doesn't matter how much Ananias gave. I'm sure it was a big amount because he was rich and he sold uh, land and he gave a big amount. But uh, you must be familiar with the story where Jesus said uh, about the widow who gave two coins to the church. But, uh, and Jesus said uh, Jesus is more pleased with her than the rich people who gave part of it. So the amount you give, it, it is not the most important thing. In some places, the amount you give, you'd get front row seats, but not in heaven, not, with, not in the God's house. The amount you give is not the most important thing. God just wants you to give everything you have. As I said, I'm not speaking about just about money. It could be anything. It could be your time, your energy, your, especially your heart. God wants your heart fully. And the second sin, <clears throat> God, we have to give God what is God's. So Ananias promised this amount, this land, to sell it and give it to God. So now it's God's. Uh, once you make a promise to God, you have to keep that word. We have to give what is God's to God. Starting with the 10% we have to give. And as I said, it's not just about money. Again, the time, your heart, we have to give what we have to give to God to God. Especially something I, we easily to see these days is not giving something that is not being given to God these days is glory. We have to give glory to God above all. When things go wrong, we blame God. But when things go right, we take the, we take the glory to ourselves. We feel like we did it. It's not us who are doing it. It's all God. It's all coming from the name of Jesus. There is no other name. There is no other name. It doesn't matter who says what. There is only one name. That name is Jesus. Jesus is the only way. So today it's very sad to see 
even inside the church, the name of Jesus is becoming smaller and smaller and smaller day by day. If you look at posters, holdings of these healing services and all that, it's very hard to separate healing service and a musical concert. Have you seen, like, especially in like Telwatha Junction, you'd see there are posters of dance, dancers and concerts, musical shows, then there's a healing service in between. It all looks the same. There is no mention of Jesus. There would be a picture of a person asking you to come to him to be healed. Is that what God is looking from us? No. The glory belongs to God because God is just using us. God used a donkey to speak to Balaam. If God can use a donkey, God can use anyone. It doesn't matter who it is. If God wants to use, God will use animals or rocks or trees if he wants. So we are nothing. Uh, Jesus tells us in uh, Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. Yeah, Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. Jesus tells us to deny ourselves. Yeah. Then Jesus, then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow him. So we have to forget about ourselves. As I said, this selfishness, this self-centered person, we have to deny that. That is where we, we are led to make mistakes. So if we can get rid of this selfishness, if we can deny this selfishness, that's when Jesus is telling us, that we can follow him. And the third mistake Ananias made was lying to Holy Spirit, lying to God. We sometimes think certain things we do, no one sees, so it's fine. That is not the case. You have to remember, doesn't matter who you are, this part of you will always be there. Even though it is like this, it is always there. So if you make a mistake and if you think no one will know, remember, Holy Spirit will know. And in Ephesians, I think it says uh, not to make Holy Spirit sad, not to make Holy Spirit grieve. So this is, this is why Ananias dropped dead. He lied to Holy Spirit. If we are sinning and we are lying, when we are justifying our sin, we are lying to Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, is, Holy Spirit is telling us not to do something, but we are trying to tell Holy Spirit, no, that's not what happened. We had to do this for this reason. We try to reason it out. But uh, that is basically lying to Holy Spirit. So <clears throat> from this story, we have to learn these three lessons that we have to give everything to God, our time, our hearts. We can't be greedy. And we have to give what God, what, what is His. We can't keep anything to ourselves. And also make sure not to lie to Holy Spirit. Be genuine, be honest to Holy Spirit. If we make a mistake, we have to repent and go back to Him. Amen. <clears throat> then another part of selfishness is, uh, if we read Philippi Philippians chapter th 2, verse 3. Sometimes we forget that there are other people. There are other people that we have to value. So Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. So this is telling us, this is a day-to-day -day practice. If we can always think about the other person before doing something, 
if everyone did that, this world would be a wonderful place. There are very small things you can do day to day. Like I see, like when, when you drive, do we think about the other person when you drive? Or do you care only about yourself when you drive? I have seen so many times people would just stop in the middle of the road to drop someone or to pick someone, creating a whole lot of chaos, traffic behind him, not caring about others, only valuing themselves, not others. Small things like that. If someone forgets to flush the toilet after using it, that is, unless you have amnesia or dementia, that is different. But if you just forget, that means you, are, you don't care about others. We have to value others all the time. We have to think others are more important. In uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Verse 24, if you put it up there, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 24. It, it talks about not our own good, not our own good, but our neighbors. If our neighbors are talking about us with someone else, do they tell that we are selfless, we are helping, we are helpful, we, are, we value others, or will they tell that we are very selfish people, we only care about ourselves? 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 24. Nobody should seek his own good, but the goods of others. In my translation, it says neighbor. So, is that the view people have of us, or do people think that we are selfish people? As children of God, others should see us as selfless people. So speaking about selflessness, who is the best example for selflessness? Jesus himself, God himself. Let me tell you why. Almighty, all powerful, all knowing, Lord of Lords, God of Gods, Master of Universe. He came to this world as an ordinary man, lived an ordinary life, ate like us, worked like us, slept like us, did all the ordinary things. You know, these days you'd see politicians going to eat roti and to drink tea. That's just, you know, for the elections. This was not like that. This was real. God came to this world and lived 30 years as an ordinary man. Imagine living in a place like heaven and leaving all that and living 30 years in a place like earth. If we think about all the facilities these presidents, these kings have, it's thousand times more in heaven. Imagine leaving all that selflessly, coming to this earth, live like an ordinary man. <clears throat> As we sang today, you came from heaven to earth. And then uh, he was crushed mentally and physically, humiliated, and died the worst possible death in the human history. That much selflessness, there we don't have to look anywhere else. He lived by, he led by an example. In John 3.16, don't have to put it, we all know, God says, uh, Jesus said, Jesus says, God so loved the world, loved the world, he gave his only son. Why did he do that? It's because to pay our debts. It, it was for us. That selfless love was for us. Are we willing to love God the same way? Will we love God no matter what? Or we, do we love God only when we get our things done? 
if we love God only when we get our things, when we get our prayers answered, that's a selfish love. To be selfless, you have to love without conditions, not just to God, to your neighbor as well. So that is the, that is the kind of person God wants you to be. Love your neighbor, love God without conditions. Forget yourself when you love someone. That is what God is expecting from you. Amen. <clears throat> so the second part of my sermon. So I believe everyone who is here, everyone who has accepted Jesus, wants to be this good person, wants this part of this part to be the powerful part, the one that is above water. I'm sure everyone here wants to be there. But the problem happens. Can, it, can we maintain it like this? Or will it turn when waves come? When, when trials, when problems, when challenges come, will it turn this way? Or will it stay like this? That is our challenge. As Christians, that is the challenge for us to be still. This reminded me, re reminded me of a dialogue from a movie. Uh, <clears throat> Who has watched Batman Dark Knight? Three, four people. <laughs> Others don't watch movies. That is one of the most famous movies ever created. <clears throat> so, the, in this movie, uh, but uh, who knows Batman? I hope everyone knows Batman at least. <laughs> Batman is a superhero. So, uh, in this movie, the villain villain is called the Joker. He's trying to prove something to Batman. That is the story. He's trying to prove a fact. I'll read what he tells. So this Joker tells Batman, there are morals, there are code. It's a bad joke. Dropped at the first sign of trouble. They are only as good as the world allows them to be. You'll see, I'll show you. When the chips are down, these civilized people, they'll eat each other. See, I'm not a monster. I'm just ahead of the curve. So this is what, in this movie, this is what Joker is trying to prove to Batman, that when troubles come, people will forget about others. People will be selfish. They will not care about others. They will try to do everything for themselves when the chips are down. So when I watched this movie, it didn't really make sense to me. And I wanted Batman to win, obviously, because he's the main character superhero. But with time, this was like 15, 16 years ago. But with time, what Joker said started to make sense. Made a made lot more sense, especially when? When the pandemic happened. The civilized, generous, loving people started stocking up milk and rice and fuel, everything for themselves, creating a global crisis, not just in Sri Lanka, a global crisis. People who we thought were good people, civilized, righteous people, started thinking only about themselves and started stocking up. What happened to the people who couldn't afford to buy in bulks? People who had daily jobs, who had daily wages, they were unable to buy things for themselves because the rich had bought everything of the supermarkets, of the shops. There was nothing for the poor. What happened to the civilized people? Joker turned out to be right. I mean, forget Sri Lanka. Let's say, I mean, in Sri Lanka, there is this mentality that people who are in Europe or in Western countries are more civilized. Like, that's why everyone is trying to leave. Don't know if you have heard, there's a new single song also. 
telling about this, leaving the country. If you haven't, check it out on YouTube. It's called Rateano. <clears throat> what happened in the Western world? We were at least trying to, you know, stock up rice and milk and fuel. What happened in West what happened in the Western world? What were people fighting for? Toilet papers. Do you think that's a joke? No. <laughs> I have friends living in Germany, I have friends living in UK. They all said this was the main problem in those was the main problem. People were actually fighting each other inside supermarkets. We think they are the most civilized, most gentle people in the world. But was that the case when this trouble came? Was that what happened there? Is that who we are? When trouble comes, does our iceberg turn around? Uh, if you turn into Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 8, Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 8. He will be like, this is how God wants us to be. He will be like a tree planted by the water that seeds, that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. This is who God wants us to be. Even when heat comes, even in a drought, we, our leaves have to be green and we have to be fruitful. That meaning our iceberg can't turn when things go wrong. That is the kind of person God wants us to be. That is that should be our ultimate challenge, to be that person, not to change, be fruitful throughout the year, not to be a seasonal Christian. When things are good, we are all generous, we are all loving, we are all caring, and when things go wrong, we forget all that, we start doing things for ourselves and forget our neighbor, our surrounding, we forget about that. That is not what God wants from you and me. So this, uh, during this uh, pandemic season, you, I mean, we all went through it. We were, it was so easy to judge others, wasn't it? Like we were blaming the government, the politicians. We were blaming all. But were we the selfless people during that time? Or were we just showing the world that we are selfless, but inside were we similar to these politicians but whom we blame it on? Like, if we get the opportunity, if we have the power, if we are one of them, are we going to do the right thing? Or are we going to do what benefits us? It's very easy to judge without being in that person's position. Like, I can judge all I want, like a politician. Like, I can tell I won't do what a politician's son is doing. But I am not a politician's son. Will I be the same or will I be different if I am one of them? It's very easy, as I said, to judge. Very easy to say things on social media. On social media, everyone is righteous. Everyone is so good, so selfless so giving, so loving. But is that the person you are inside? This reminded me of a story <clears throat> one of my friends told me. Uh, during the pandemic, when the uh, fuel crisis happened, my friend works for a, he worked for a very big company in Sri Lanka. It's a well-known company. Uh, he was the head of procurement. And with the power cuts for them to run their factories, they needed fuel. They didn't have the fuel uh, to run their factories. So as he was the head of procurement, he was told to find fuel. 
So his bosses, so the, they, they don't think from this part, you know, in the corporate world, it's like this. They don't think about morals or what is the right thing, it doesn't matter. Even if it is from the moon, he had to bring fuel. So my friend, he, as it is his job, he looked everywhere to find fuel somehow. Then he found a person from far away, a, a petrol shed owner, spoke to him. He made, a, he made an arrangement for him to supply petrol for this company. What was the arrangement? Those days, as far as I can remember, petrol was like 230 per liter. The petrol shed owner said, he will give a whole Bowser for one liter, he'd charge 500 rupees. So more than twice. It is profitable for him because, you know, he doesn't have to do all the pumping and all that. He can keep his petrol shed, shed shut. He can tell the people there is no fuel. He agreed to this. He agreed to sell the fuel for more than double the price for a black market price. So my friend, he had no choice because, uh, as I said, there's no morals in the corporate world. He had to buy this. They were willing to pay whatever the amount he wanted. So uh, in the first transaction, my friend had gone personal to meet this person. And when he was giving the check, this person has said, <laughs> while accepting this black market price check, he's blaming someone else. Isn't he the problem? Isn't that the problem? Are we just going to blame our politicians and the governments and whoever was there for the 72 or whatever years? Or are we going to change ourselves and be good examples and lead by an example to the society as good Christians? That is the challenge we have today. And lastly, I want to tell you, we sometimes get tired of doing the right thing. Doesn't it happen to you? It has happened to me sometimes do selfless, selfless acts over and over and over again. And we feel like, why do we do this? We sometimes feel like people are taking advantage of us. People call us stupid for being selfless. There is no benefit to us. So we sometimes get discouraged to do the right thing. If you turn to Gala, Galatians chapter 6, verse 9, uh, God is telling us, <coughs> let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. So God wants you not to give up, not to get tired, not to get weary. Hold on to being that good person you are, Whatever the circumstance, whatever the situation, God will reward you when the time is right. Not, it might be not when you want, but God, God knows when to reward you. And this also reminded me of something I saw on the internet. This is something uh, Mother Teresa has said. Uh, I summarized it a bit. I'll read it to you. If you are kind, people may accuse, accuse you of selfish, ulterior motives. Be kind anyway. If you are honest and sincere, people may deceive you. Be honest and sincere anyway. What you spent years creating, others could destroy overnight. Create anyway. The good you do today will often be forgotten. Do good. Anyway, give the best you have, and it will never be enough. 
give your best anyway. In the final analysis, it is not between you and them. It is between you and God anyway. Isn't that beautiful? Always remember the reward comes from God. So do the right thing anyway. Before I close my sermon, I'll tell you something that happened to me just like 10 days ago. While I was preparing for this sermon, while I was writing the notes, I had this Mother Teresa's uh, quote screen, at the screenshot in my phone, I was writing this. <coughs> Uh, it was uh, like 10, 12 days ago. It was the time for our uh, yearly profit bonus in where I work. So I work in tourism. So we get, uh, according to our performances, we get a yearly bonus. So uh, on the day of the bonus that we, the day of the day we receive the bonus, uh, we were hoping, like all me and my colleagues, we were hoping for random amount. Uh, because, you know, uh, me personally, I, I really enjoy my job. So uh, uh, doing things for my clients, the tourists, I really enjoy it. I go above and beyond to keep them happy. It gives me pleasure. So it might... I might not even get feedbacks, no benefits, nothing, but I still keep it because like one out of 10 would give a good feedback. But still I like to do it. I do everything possibly I can to keep my clients happy. So when this bonus came, I was hoping my company has seen it, my bosses must have seen it, and I was expecting uh, an amount and I will receive it. So. On the day of the bonus, when we received it, it was nowhere close to what I expected. It was a lot less than what I expected. And I called my colleague uh, who looks after the candy area. Uh, I called him and started, you know, blabbering and started blaming the company. What is this much? I'm no point doing this. And I, I told him, I'm going to stop doing all this extra work for our clients, going this extra mile, going above and beyond to help them. What's the point? No point. No one sees it. We don't get the feedbacks. We don't get the reviews. Nothing. I'm going to stop this. And he also agreed. He, he, he's quite similar to me. He works the same ways as I do. He spends from his own pocket to keep the clients happy. So we both agreed on this. We are not going to do this anymore. And I kept the phone. Then I walked into my room. Then I saw my, saw my no, notes. It felt like it is looking at me. And it was, it was telling me to do it anyway. So I want you all as well to do the right thing anyway. It doesn't matter if it benefits you or not. God will reward you on time. Amen.